today, who turned up the gravity? Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, where I'm just post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Well, this week we saw more falls on the markets as the volatility continued and uncertainty raged. So in this week's market review, we're going to consider some of the factors which are amplifying the gravity effects. These forces are substantial, to say the least. While US stocks came off session lows, Bonds climbed at the end of a week marked by a standoff between the West and Russia, as well as continuing worries about the Federal Reserve's next policy steps. As a result, volatility continued, with the US fear index sitting at 28.12. The benchmark US stock indices hit a second week of losses, undermined by that standoff between Russia and the West over Ukraine, as well as the prospect of tighter Federal Reserve monetary policy. And some $2.2 trillion of US stock options expired on Friday. Oh, and US markets will be closed on Monday in observance of President's Day. The Dow Jones Industrial Average was down 0.68% to 34,072. The S&P 500 Index fell 0.78% to 4,347. And the IT segment in that was down 0.95% and the energy was the worst performer amongst the indices 11 sectors. The Nasdaq Composite Index declined 1.23% to 13,536. And the so-called death cross crystallised in the index, that's a bearish chart pattern that has at times pre-staged further weakness. For the week, the Dow was around 2% down, while the S&P 500 was around one7 lower, and the Nasdaq was almost 1.9% lower. Renewed fears of a Russian invasion of Ukraine added to weekly losses for markets for buyers on Friday. Geopolitical headlines surrounding the tensions in Ukraine and Russia and the rest of the world throughout the West clearly have been impacting sentiment, said Kay Sazaki, Senior Investment Portfolio Manager at Northern Trust Wealth Management. Geopolitics events are very difficult to predict, he said, with continuing anxiety over the potential for a Russian attack on Ukraine. President Biden spoke on continued efforts to pursue deterrence and diplomacy and Russia's build-up of military troops on the border of Ukraine. Diplomatic efforts aimed at heading off an invasion remain in focus, with Biden also expected to speak with European leaders. Concerns about conflict having intensified after US and NATO officials said evidence on the ground showed Russia had increased troop levels near Ukraine's borders despite Moscow announcing earlier in the week that some units were pulling back, while Biden had said the probability of an attack in coming days remains high. US State Department spokesman Ned Price said late on Thursday that US Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov would meet late next week, provided there is no further Russian invasion of Ukraine. Blinken said on Friday that he is deeply concerned that Russia isn't embarked on the path of diplomacy and that Russia appears to be creating false provocations in Ukraine designed to spark a conflict with Ukraine. Northern Trust Sasaki said he's looking for buying opportunities amid investors' knee-jerk reaction to headlines surrounding Ukraine with a preference for higher quality stocks in developed markets. Geopolitical tensions so far haven't changed his fundamental views on inflation or the prospect of rising rates, which have been core issues for the market, he said. And in trying to decode the markets, one important question is leverage, specifically stock market margin debt. Essentially, you buy stock on borrowed funds, assuming they will rise, and you can then sell them later at a profit. So the question is how much leverage is out there. That actually is a very tricky question because much of the stock market leverage isn't reported at all. We may include securities-based lending, derivatives and other instruments and even banks and brokers that fund this leverage don't know the leverage in the overall market or even the leverage of their own clients if that client is leveraged as well at other banks. In fact, the only view we have regularly is data from FINRA that's a government-authorised not-for-profit organisation that oversees US broker-dealers. Their latest data shows that stock market margin debt, after 
a very strong spike during the Fed's QE money printing and interest rate extravaganza that started in March 2020 has plunged by $80 billion in January from December, which is the largest dollar decline in the data. And that goes all the way back to 1990. And it's the third month in a row of declines. That $830 billion is the current title. Now, high leverage in the stock market is one of the preconditions for a massive sell-off. Now, in October, just before the sell-off took shape in the Nasdaq, the Fed warned in its financial stability report about high leverage among young retail investors. The median leverage ratios of younger retail investors are more than double those of all investors, leaving those investors potentially more vulnerable to large swings in stock prices as they have a larger debt burden, they said. Moreover, this vulnerability is amplified as investors are now increasingly using options which can often boost leverage and amplify losses. A potentially destabilizing outcome could emerge if elevated risk appetite amongst retail investors retreats rapidly to more moderate levels, the Fed said. So margin debt is a great accelerator on the way up because it creates buying pressure with borrowed money and on the way down because it creates forced selling pressure. And we know that as stocks have dropped, forced sales are part of the picture as leverage is forcibly unwound. This, in effect, amplifies the gravity effect, putting more pressure on stocks and to the downside. And my suspicion is more leverage will be unwound in the weeks ahead, and this will push markets lower in a negative feedback loop. And then we have the old favourite Fed rate rises. Bets on a sharper Fed interest rate rise in March have actually eased somewhat in the light of the threat of military conflict, but investors remain concerned by the question of how markets will cope as fiscal and monetary stimulus ebbs. You could almost say that the rumour of war allows the Fed more wriggle room, which is convenient since they have done nothing yet. The Fed balance sheet grew once again last week to $8.91 trillion, and the cash rate is still stuck in its ultra-low setting. And yet, St. Louis Federal Reserve President James Bullard, who has called for more aggressive rate increases than his colleagues on Thursday, said too much mindshare has been devoted to the idea that inflation will moderate at some point. And on Friday, President of the New York Federal Reserve John Williams said it would be appropriate to raise the central bank's benchmark short-term interest rate in March and begin to reduce its $9 trillion stockpile of bonds later this year. And also on Friday, Chicago Fed President Charles Evans said he sees no need for extra restrictive rate hikes, which triggered past recessions in remarks to the US Monetary Policy Forum, and said that the current stance of monetary policy is, quote, wrong-footed. Evans, who's been among the most dovish US central bankers, said surging inflation called for a major shift in monetary policy, while giving a more cautious view for longer-term tightening. The current stance of monetary policy is wrong-footed and needs substantial adjustment, Evans noted. Fear can be a good development for the market, wrote Callie Cox, US investment analyst at eToro. When investors get nervous, they tend to add more cash and hedge their positions. The worst market storms typically happens when investors least expect it. Right now, we're hedged and ready for a big punch to the stomach, but it may not hurt as badly as we think. It's a good recipe for a relief rally when the headlines calm down. And Wynne Thin, global head of currency strategy at Brown Brothers Harriman, wrote, The situation remains fluid and we believe markets will remain subject to bouts of risk-on, risk-off in the coming days. Farid Razakweza, an analyst with Think Markets, said, While there have been some reports of de-escalation in tensions, nothing has changed fundamentally to prevent investors from remaining fearful about a possible Russian invasion. Beyond this, investor sentiment is likely to remain downbeat anyway, given concerns about surging inflationary pressures around the world and policy tightening from the Fed. The US sovereign debt attracted $7.4 billion in inflows, and that's the most since the coronavirus pandemic first struck, according to a Bank of America note. And after their worst start in a year in decades, treasuries are reasserting their haven status and eclipsing the appeal of riskier assets. That's a troubling combination for strategists. And in the US, 
Economic data showed that existing home sales increased by nearly 7% between December and January, hitting a season-adjusted annual rate of 6.5 million. The National Association of Realtors said on Friday, Economists polled by MarketWatch expected the pace of home sales to come in at 6.1 million. And separately, an index of leading economic indicators for US fell 0.3% in January on surging Omicron cases, high inflation and persistent supply chain disruptions. The decline in the index was the first since last spring. And Wall Street has expected a small increase. The LEI is a weighted gauge of 10 indicators designed to signal business cycle peaks and valleys. Leading economic indicators did disappoint this morning. Suzuki said he expects U.S. economic growth will remain positive this year, but that it will be slower and more sustainable. The U.S. economy grew by 5.7% in 2021, its fastest since 1984, from a 3.5% contraction in 2020 caused by the coronavirus pandemic. But inflation grew even faster, with the consumer price index expanding 7% in the year to December. That's its most since 1982. The Federal Reserve's preferred inflation tool, the Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index, which excludes volatile food and energy prices, expanded by 5.8% in the year to January. Of course, the Fed had slashed interest rates to almost zero after the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic in March 2020, and is expected to resort to a series of rate hikes this year to counter inflation. But of course, will they? And if they do, how much and when is the big question. The markets should do just fine in 2022, even with expected rate hikes from the Fed, as stocks will be supported by positive earnings growth, according to Stephen Violin, portfolio manager at FL Putnam Investment Management Company. As for buying opportunities in US equities, the shift into value from growth is, quote, pretty well advanced, said Violin. Some growth stocks have declined enough to become attractive, he said, and some value stocks have appreciated enough to become unattractive. Shares in the iShares S&P 500 growth ETF are down around 13% this year, while the iShares S&P 500 value ETF has only declined 3%. In Violin's view, there seems to be a lot of runaway for value stocks outside the United States. And looking at specific stocks, Roku reported earnings on Thursday that topped Wall Street forecast, but fourth quarter revenue that didn't. The company also warned of continuing supply chain disruptions and shares were down around 22.29%. And the shares of Draft Kings were down more than 21.6% as the online betting company's upbeat forecast on profitability in 2023 was overshadowed by a wider than expected projected loss in 2022 as competition in online sports gambling intensifies. And shares of the Ford Motor Company rose 2.85% amid reports that it is considering separating its electric vehicle operation from its legacy car and truck manufacturing, a move seen to boost its competitiveness against EV-focused markets such as Tesla. Tesla's shares were down around 2.2%. The yield on the 10-year Treasury note fell 2.21% to 1.93, and for the week the yield fell 2.1 basis points for the biggest weekly decline since Friday, January the 21st. The two-year was pretty flat at 1.4778. And the US dollar index, which is a measure of the currency against a basket of six major rivals, edged up 0.3% to 96.07. Oil futures fell, with West Texas intermediate crude slipping nearly 0.25% to settle at 91.53 a barrel. In fact, oil prices slipped, heading for a weekly fall as traders digested the raised prospects of Iranian oil returning to the global market, which outweighed ongoing Russia-Ukraine risks. A draft accord is taking shape that outlines a sequence of steps that would eventually lead to the removal of oil sanctions on the Persian Gulf country's crude exports. Such a deal could result in an additional 1 million barrels a day of oil coming back onto the market. And gold slipped 0.17% to settle at 1,898 an ounce. For the week, gold rose 3.1%. That's its biggest weekly rise since May 2021 finishing up for a third week in a row with the biggest weekly gain in three months as a combination of geopolitical concerns over the Russia-Ukraine conflict and soaring US inflation drove a horde of safe haven buyers into the yellow metal. Earlier on Friday, it hit an intraday peak of 1,905, marking an eight-month high with June being the last time that gold got to the 1,900 level. 
Gold prices have had quite a February and should find key resistance around 1930 said Ed Moyer, analyst at online trading platform Onya. With Monday being a holiday in the US, that might hold if Ukraine tensions do not escalate further. In just a couple of months, investors have done an about-face with gold, he said. Wall Street has gone from expecting robust economic growth around 4% this year and a return to normal next year to fears that aggressive Fed tightening could invert the yield curve next year and send this economy into recession early in 2024. Over in the UK, London stocks stuck to the flat line on Friday as geopolitical tensions continued to weigh on the UK index. Retailers were in the spotlight after upbeat government data and a Russian-linked commodity company was set for hefty gains. The FTSE 100 was down 0.32% at 7,513, while the pound US dollar was down 0.13% to 1.3597, and the FTSE was down around 1.9% over the week. UK retail sales rebounded in January as concerns about the effects of the Omicron variant of COVID-19 eased. Sales volumes rose 1.9% from a month earlier, according to the Office of National Statistics. That compares to a forecast for a 2% gain. Better than expected retail sales suggest that, for now, the increased cost of living is not preventing Britons from hitting the shops, said AJ Bell financial analyst Danny Hewson in the note to clients. Expect that to be tested through the course of the year, with retailers likely to face an increasingly difficult quandary about how much of their increased costs they can pass on to customers and how much pain to endure themselves, he said. But retailers were swinging into the black, with shares of B&M European Value Retail up 1.35%, luxury goods maker Burberry rising 1.96%, and Associated British Foods up 0.45%. Against the backdrop of a severe storm, utilities were in focus, with National Grid up 0.3%, United Utilities up 1.05%, and Seven Trent rising 0.78%. Storm Eunice triggered severe weather warnings, shutting down rail travel, and caused havoc for planes trying to land at major airports with winds over 80 miles an hour. And storms across Europe also disrupted travel. Everaz, a UK-listed steel company with operations in Russia, came under pressure again on Friday, topping the decliners list with a 7.24% tumble. The shares have been swinging around this week as investors have closely watched tensions between the West and Russia. Following a massive rally at the start of the week, Everaz's shares are still headed for their best weekly return of 10% since August 2020. And the bank, NatWest, fell 2% after the UK lender relied on releasing more provisions for souring loans in order to beat earnings estimates in the fourth quarter. We're seeing that behaviour from banks all over the place at the moment. Very little revenue, but a lot of release provisions. European stock markets edged higher on Friday with investors digesting the news that Russia and the US are set to meet next week, raising hopes that there can be a diplomatic solution to the Ukraine crisis. But the DAX in Germany was down 0.47% to 15,042, while the CAC 40 in France was down 0.25%. France's unemployment rate fell in the final quarter of last year to the lowest level since 2008, dropping to 7.4% from 8% in the previous three months. That's better than the expected 7.8%. Corporate news from France, though, was not as good. Electre de France stock fell 4% after the French government announced it would pump in over 2 billion euros to prop up the troubled state-controlled power group, with the company undertaking a 2.5 billion euro rights issue as a consequence. Hermes fell 4.8% after the luxury house said sales grew by 11% in the fourth quarter of 21 a touch below market expectations that had driven the stock to an eye-wateringly high valuation by late last year. It's now down nearly 30% from November, but still trades at over 50 times 2021 earnings. And more encouragingly, Renault climbed 4.5% after the French auto giant posted a profit for 2021, beating expectations after two straight years of losses aggravated by the coronavirus pandemic and subsequent chip supply issues. And staying in the auto sector, Volkswagen fell 0.3% after a container ship carrying a number of the group's vehicles from Germany to the US caught fire, 
near the coast of Portugal's Azores Islands. And the stocks Europe 600 closed 0.8% lower and booked a 1.9% weekly slump. The only major index which managed to claw back some losses and end the trading session in the green on Friday was in fact the Shanghai Composite, finishing with a 0.66% gain and that booked a 0.8% weekly advance. The Hang Seng though declined 1.9% in Hong Kong for a 2.3% drop for the week and Japan's Nikkei 225 fell 0.4% on the session for a 2.1% weekly decline. Japanese national core and headline CPI figures for January were released. There was no initial forecast available for the headline number, but the actual one came out at up 0.5%, which was lower than the previous 0.8% higher. The core CPI had been forecast to have fallen slightly, going from 0.5% to 0.3%, but the actual readings showed up at 0.2%. The main contributing sectors to declining inflation were culture, recreation and housing. Now it's worth reminding ourselves that the Bank of Japan aims for a 2% inflation target. Until then, no rate hikes are on the table. And the Japanese yen did not move much as it remains more vulnerable to geopolitical tensions. So the Nikkei 225 was down 0.41% to 27,122. In Australia, Australian shares advanced for the third week in a row, buoyed by robust earnings from blue chip stocks that offset volatility sparked by those escalating tensions between Russia and Ukraine. The S&P ASX 200 edged 0.1% higher this week, despite dropping 1% to 7,221 on Friday. QBE was Friday's biggest laggard, tumbling 8.7% to $11.55, after its cash earnings came in almost 5% below market expectations and its final dividend of 19 cents per share was lower than anticipated. Shares in Magellan surged 18.5% to 21.70 after it delivered a 24% rise in first half profit and said it will consider buying back shares on the market. ANZ was down 0.25% to 28.15. CBA was down 0.07% to 97.75. NAB fell 0.88% to $30.58. And Westpac rose 0.17% to 23.53. But Macquarie was down 2.32% to 191.11. Ingham's said it would start to see supply and labour pressures ease but Omicron costs will take a $24 million chunk out of its second half profit. And so the stock slid 5.1% to $3.35. Origin Energy tumbled 8.3% to $5.65 following Thursday's shock announcement of its plans to bring forward the closure of its Erring coal plant by seven years to 2025. And Whitehaven Coal firmed 4% to $3.14. Gold miners posted strong gains as the precious metals price briefly traded above 1,900 US. Remulus Resources added 3.5% to $1.50, Newcrest rose 2.1% to 2436 and Silver Lake Resources climbed 2% to $1.80. Smart Group jumped 11.7% to $8.24 after it reported a 42% increase in net profit in calendar year 2021. The company raised its final dividend to 19 cents and will pay a special dividend of 30 cents per share. And finally to crypto, two weeks ago Bitcoin rose 15% plus to nearly $42,000 US, only for traders and retail investors alike to become frustrated at how range-bound this world's most significant digital currency has been in recent days, with not much movement up or down since then, aside from some tiny fluctuations here and there. Do something, the crowd cried out in unison as they watched their investments plummet towards $43,000. But be careful what you wish for because yesterday's latest pullback had Bitcoin on the reverse track. The cryptocurrency could test resistance at $38,000, potentially sending ripple effects throughout all of the markets. Fear is gripping the crypto markets as investors watch their investments fleeing debasing fiat currencies. However, with Fed Chair Jerome Powell signaling an aggressive turn towards inflation, Bitcoin's prime narratives are actually coming undone, and it's no longer a haven for escaping this ever-debasing world of currency. When everyone else is panicking, it's an excellent time to buy. A famous quotation from Warren Buffett goes, Be fearful when others are greedy, 
and be greedy when others are fearful. Well, that seems pretty appropriate right now with Bitcoin closing in on its $38,000 mark. That high resistance off of 43,000 looks such an impossible task right now, though. Russia is a very unpredictable factor when it comes to Bitcoin. If Russian President Putin says something, the price of Bitcoin can quickly go up or down by several thousand dollars in just minutes from his statement. The country's leader has constantly been making headlines for years and will continue to do so for as long as the new updates on what he might say next regarding international issues, such as alliances or other country leaders. So volatility is going to continue. And I think we're going to see that across all markets and all different asset classes. This is not a time, in my view, to be making big bets but rather positioning for better news in the future. So it is interesting to see how some market analysts are still spruiking the major opportunity to go into the market now. But I have to say that I think people should be cautious. Remember that a lot of these institutions trade on trade, as it were. They want people to do more transactions. And the last thing they want is people to go on strike and just sit on the sidelines. But with gravity increasing, with the risk to the downside getting more severe, maybe sitting on the sidelines is actually a pretty comfortable position just now. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.